What's up everybody, it's that white boy from the yard and I'm back at it again with another video. Today we are talking about the full newbie guide of a injectable SARM cycle um, and specifically we are going to talk about the SARM Magnolone which is the injectable form of LGD4033. Now, as a disclaimer, I'm not a doctor. I don't have any form of medical degrees or whatsoever. I don't pretend to be a doctor. Don't listen to what I say. This is all my personal opinion and how I see things. So always go to a doctor before using any form of supplementation. So I want to do a bodybuilding competition by the end of next year, which is 2020, around December. Um, so I want to pack on a lot of more muscle mass this off season. So I've never done any form of injectables before, but if I would do any form of injectable performance enhancing drugs, then I would personally choose SARMs over steroids. So I wrote down a couple of questions. Now, who could answer these questions better than Dr. Tony Huge from Enhanced Athlete? So today in this episode, I'm with Dr. Tony Huge. Welcome, Tony. Hey, white boy from the yard. Sure, I'd be glad to answer your questions about injectable SARBs, performance enhancing drugs, and how you can best prepare for your first bodybuilding competition. Put on as much mass as possible, get as lean as possible, shred it as possible, and do it as healthy as possible so you can keep doing it the rest of your life and look awesome. So let's say if I or someone who have never done any form of performance enhancing drugs as injectables before and chooses uh, SARMs over steroids for some reason, um, there are lots of things a newbie in this industry should and want to know. So I wrote down a couple of questions, like I said, to clarify the usage of Magnolone. And uh, actually it's a complete cycle guide. So for someone who wants to do a Magnolone or injectable SARM cycle, this is every knowledge you need to know. So the first question is, what is actually the difference between Magnolone and Magnolone XR? Because I did a little bit of research myself and I saw there were two types of Magnolone. So what's what's it about? The difference between Magnolone and Magnolone XR. Let's see if Hottie Alert knows the answer. Regular Magnolone you need to do every day or every other day. Magnolone XR every five to seven days depending on what kind of gains you're trying to create. What your body looks like. So Magnolone's a SARM but it's similar to steroid esters, right? If you inject just testosterone suspension, testosterone by itself, only lasts like six, eight hours in the body, you'd have to keep injecting it multiple times per day. That's why they attach an ester to it that makes it like a slow release delivery, like an extended release. That way we only have to inject it every, you know, like testosterone cypionate or enanthate are the most popular. That's why we only have to inject testosterone like every three days, four days, every five days. Some people like Coach Trevor inject testosterone only once every 10 days and just take about like uh, 300 milligrams. So what the problem is though, if you're going to uh, use a Magnolone XR and it's 50 milligrams per ml, and we want to do like 20 milligrams per day, then if we're going to inject it only, uh, you know, once every five days, which is okay, that means we've got to inject, you know, like two cc's of it or something versus I prefer to inject just one cc each time. Uh, so if I wanted to do like uh, uh, 10 milligrams per day uh, of, of Magnolone or LGD4033, then I could do either uh, 10 milligrams every day of regular Magnolone or 20 milligrams every other day of regular Magnolone, or I could use the Magnolone XR and I could do it every third day, fourth day, or every fifth day to maintain steady blood levels. Uh, so if I was gonna do it every fifth day with the Magnolone XR, I could do 50 milligrams, which is one cc, once every five days of Magnolone XR, if my priority is less uh, injection frequency, if I want to inject less often. But I don't mind injecting every other day because it's only a little insulin needle. It's like not even a hassle at all. So I personally just use the regular Magnolone and then I just inject it either every day if I want to do a high dosage or if I'm doing a little lower dosage, I just inject it every other day. So the only difference between Magnolone and Magnolone XR is that XR stands for extended release. Um, which requires a less frequency of injections. Um, but I will get back to how often to inject in a minute. Now, what would be better for, let's say, an off-season bulk? Would that be uh, using Magnolone or Rage Balone, which is the injectable form of RAT140? Magnolone is more effective for bulking than Rage Balone. See, Rage Balone is really awesome for mental drive and aggression and strength and mind-muscle connection and performance but it just doesn't put on as much mass 
as Magnolone does. Now, it does. All SARMs do put on mass, depending on your diet and training protocol. But Magnolone, we've seen some of the most incredible gains of any compound we've ever used. I mean, we're talking Anadrol, testosterone, DECA, uh, Trenbolone. Magnolone is put on, when combined with other things in Synergy, more mass than any of those other compounds. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, water, though, because something like a DECA or testosterone will put on a ton of water, whereas Magnolone will only put a small amount of water on. But just to give you an idea of how, how powerful the actual lean tissue mus mass muscle uh, is gained uh, on Magnolone is comparable to the best, actually exceeds some of the best bulking gear out there, minus the like the, the unwanted water retention, because we do want some water retention of the muscle. Magnolone doesn't create that unwanted water retention. So what would be better for an off-season bulk if you don't really care about the sex drive effects that Rage Balloon got, then you would choose Magnolone over Rage Balloon to pack on as much lean muscle mass as possible um, and also have a little bit of the positive effects of the water retention instead of the negative effect. Okay, that's good. Well. Um, what would be the best place to inject SARMs, you know, the injection sites and are they different than injection sites from different steroids or whatever? And I wanted to add to the question is what needle to use, but you actually clarified already that it should be an insulin needle, but why would you use an insulin needle and would it also work while using Magnolone XR because you needed to do 50 milligrams like you said. The locations I inject uh, Magnolone or any injectable SARMs are all the same as steroid injection locations, which is by preference mostly, but I like to do my shoulders or my upper outer glutes. So like right this upper outer quadrant right here, those are my two favorite. And then I used to also like doing right here in the brachialis but I don't like doing that as much because it did build some scar tissue, which is not permanent. You can scrape out the scar tissue. As for the size needles, this is my preference, 29 gauge half inch, uh, because I'm really lean, so I can get it into the muscle layer. It doesn't have to penetrate a fat layer because see, there's no fat. So in, anywhere on my body, uh, I get it half an inch into the muscle. Whereas someone, if they were fatter, they would, they, it wouldn't be long enough to get into their muscle layer. But that's not a problem. I mean, you could technically, I could put it into my fat layer. I just prefer to put it into the muscle layer. Uh, so the normal way to inject gear or something like injectable SARMs would be this type of syringe. This is a one cc syringe and this is a three cc syringe. So if I was gonna do one cc or less, I would prefer to use a one cc syringe like this that has uh, it's called a lure lock. That means twist on the, the end tips to it. And I use a bigger needle like this, like an 18 gauge, to draw the oil out of the bottle or the gear or injectable storm. And then this is the standard size that's used to inject steroids and, and performance hands. 23 gauge for oil based, 23 gauge 1.25 inch. I don't like that. I don't like big needles like that. I always try to use the smallest needle possible. So on a on a, the smallest common needle possible on a 1cc syringe is a 27 gauge one inch like that. And technically I could actually even do a 27 gauge one inch with the three cc uh, syringe barrels if I was gonna do more than one cc. Okay, so to recap, my preference is this. It just takes longer to load, that's the drawback, and, and the needle's pretty short uh, for people that have a f bigger fat layer. And my second preference, if I'm doing 1cc or less, would be the 1cc with the 27 gauge one inch tip. And if I was gonna inject more than 1cc, like I was gonna do two cc's of Magalone XR every five days or something like that, then I would be using a 3cc and I would still use the 27 gauge probably, but it's, it would be really hard to push it through. I'd have to, I'd have to warm up the, the oil. And so the one that's more likely for it to flow much smoother would be a 25 gauge one inch if it's on a 3cc barrel. The reason why is because the larger in diameter the barrel is, like 3cc is larger diameter than 1cc, then the larger diameter needle you need to be able to push it through because of leverage. So on a 1cc, I can push it through 27 gauge, I can push through 29 gauge, but on a 3cc, 
it would be really hard, or it'd be impossible to push it through a 29 gauge. It'd be really, it's hard on a 27, it'd be much easier on a 25 gauge. Okay, so if you would be doing Magnolone XR, or like let's say every other fifth day, then you would need a 3cc barrel with a 27 gauge needle, but preferably with a 25 gauge needle for the leverage, or you just have to inject a little bit more often. Now, okay, what about a post-cycle therapy? I mean, let's say with an oral LGD cycle, you could get off with a, a, a PCT like a Rimastain or something like that, but do you need something that's a little bit more harsh on the body while injecting uh, LGD? Let's say Nolvadex or Clomid or something like that. The PCT, post-cycle therapy for Magnolone. So if the main goal is to get back our natural testosterone production, assuming that it was uh, slightly suppressed from the Magnolone cycle, uh, if it were only doing five milligrams of Magalone per day, there's probably not going to be much suppression and probably not much of a PCT required. And five milligrams alone is actually effective at building muscle. But as we increase the dosage, uh, like when we have pro bodybuilders replace their giant steroid cycles with Magalone, they're doing 50 milligrams a day. And at that point, it becomes highly suppressive and you actually just want to follow uh, a steroid PCT, just like any normal steroid cycle PCT you'd want, is what we use when we're using a very high dosage of Magnolone. Now, if we're doing a, a lower dosage, medium dosage, like 10 milligrams, 15, 20 milligrams of, of Magnolone per day, then at that dosage, we don't need a full steroid PCT. We can do something less, uh, like, like basically half the dosage of a steroid PCT cycle for half the amount of time would still be effective because after a SARM cycle, natural testosterone comes back much faster than steroids, if it is even suppressed in the, in the first place, depending on the dosage. So just as a wild example, a PCT for a Magnolone cycle might be something like uh, 20 milligrams of Noldovidex tamoxifen per day for two weeks, or and or 50 milligrams of Clomid, Clomiphene for uh, two weeks to a month and uh, or well actually and HCG uh, 1000 IU twice per week uh, for like two and a half weeks something like that and, and a natural testosterone booster that gives us all the raw materials we need to make more testosterone all the nutrients the minerals the vitamins uh, and then there's the things like the uh, stinging nettle that is in natural testosterone boosters like the blue ox has all these things and that uh, Increases free testosterone reduces sex hormone binding globulin uh, You've got things like tribulus terrestris long jack that Increase testosterone. They're actually effective. I guess the way to summarize it is to say That natural testosterone boosters if they're really good ones like the blue ox is are actually very effective during PCT whereas they might not be that effective if your natural testosterone levels are really high and what about the half-life of Magnolone? Is it anything different than the regular form of LGD-4033? Half-life of Magnolone, well, it is based on the LGD-4033 SARM, which is 24 to 36 hour half-life. Uh, injecting it changes it just a little bit, but not a lot. And that's a pretty big range, 24 to 36. The point is that it really doesn't have to be administered every single day. It could be taken every other day. Uh, but I prefer to do it every day because I just usually use a high enough dosage to where it's worth taking it every day. Okay, well, let's say you have like no experience at all with syringes and needles and whatsoever. Then how, how do you get the right amount of Magnolone into the syringe itself? How do I get the right dosage of Magnolone? Well, this is an insulin syringe. It's a 1cc syringe. It goes up to 100 units. Uh, now, I, if I'm doing a really high dosage, I'm filling this entire thing up with the Magnolone, and since the Magnolone is 50 milligrams, 50, 50 milligrams per 1 ml, then, and 1 ml is 100 IU on an insulin needle, then that means that is 50 milligrams. So if I was going to do 25 milligrams, I'd go to the 50 mark, which is 0.5 ml, which is half of an insulin needle. And if I was going to do uh, 10, uh, 10 milligrams, that would be to the 20 mark on the insulin needle. See how small that is? That's basically just a couple drops. That's how powerful the Magnolone is. Uh, now, if I'm using a bigger syringe, it might not have these 190, 80, because this is what an insulin needle has. 
but it has ml on it and 100 equals 1 ml so if i had a 1 ml syringe that didn't have these lines i would just know that half of 1 ml means half of 50 milligrams means 25 milligrams of magdalone okay so let's say i will buy myself some magdalone online and when i receive it at home do i need to mix it something like with any oils or esters or whatsoever or is it actually good to go when receiving does magnolone need to be mixed with anything no and i think you're asking this because a lot of peptides come in a little vial with powder inside and you have to mix it with water or acetic acid to reconstitute it before injecting because you can't inject raw powder but no the magnolone already comes in sort of an oily a very thin oily solution so it's ready for application there's nothing that needs to be added to it nothing that needs to be used to dilute it okay now something that a lot of people might be worrying about while doing a cycle of whatever kind of performance enhancing drugs and which is cholesterol i mean do we need to watch cholesterol while on magnolone will it thicken blood or whatsoever or because cholesterol really seems to be like a negative side effect to whatever forms of pd like i said but everybody thinks arms are like like side effect free but you have to take care of a couple things as well which one of the things is cholesterol so does magnolone affect cholesterol do we have to worry about how it affects cholesterol it absolutely does affect cholesterol but our experiments so far are showing it affects cholesterol less than the oral version, the LGD4033, for the effective dosage. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I prefer injecting magnolone over using oral SARMs. Uh, but even though all anabolic substances, pretty much every steroid has a negative impact on cholesterol, uh, it doesn't really matter that much. What we're finding out, and if you talk to any a cardiovascular scientist, I'll say, not doctor, I'm saying scientists, like the ones that are leading the research on cholesterol and its implications in our health and, and what really matters as far as the variables in heart disease, we're finding out that the increase in bad cholesterol and the decrease in HDL, so the increase in the LDL, which is the protein transport of cholesterol, and the uh, decrease of the good cholesterol, the good lipoprotein transporter of cholesterol, the HDL, the decrease of that, has much less of an impact on our cardiovascular health and our longevity than we once thought. So I used to be very concerned about my cholesterol, and it was one of my biggest fears when it came to steroids in general, but here we have LGD and now Magnolone, which has a lesser impact on my cholesterol than most of the steroids, and I'm not even worried that much about the impact of steroids on cholesterol now that I know that there's other variables and uh, lifestyle choices and things in my diet that are actually having a much bigger impact in a negative way on my cholesterol than the anabolics. So I hope that makes, makes sense because people are going to get their lab work done on SARMs in general, on steroids in general, and they're going to notice uh, their lipid panel, their cholesterol is going to look worse but the net net effect of that on our health is actually, uh, by my opinion and based on my research, uh, a very minimal impact on our actual health and longevity. And it's definitely something, not trying to sell people on taking steroids, but I'm just gonna say from my personal analysis, it is definitely unequivocally worth a, a, a little decrease in my cholesterol for all of the other massive benefits in which these compounds provide. Okay, good. And can you tell us anything about what would the best cycle length be? Like I said, for an off-season bulk, if you want to put on as much mass as possible, as healthy as possible, stay as lean as possible, um, would that be 8 weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, um, and why? Magdalene cycle length? Well, it doesn't really matter. I mean, everybody kind of sticks to a standard sort of 4, 6, 8, 12-week cycle of things. The, there's, a, there's a few reasons why people stick to sort of cycle lengths like that, um, but I would say the only reason that makes the most sense to me is the, that you do notice some sort of desensitization to any anabolic compounds after about six weeks generally, with some exceptions. So by default, I guess, if I'm going to run a straight cycle of something, although I like to alternate between compounds very quickly or just use things as needed, but if I'm going to like do a strict set cycle, I'm probably sticking with about six weeks of generally any compound. Uh, and so that would be magnolone. And then I'm switching to another compound after six weeks 
or I'm increasing the dosage, or I'm taking a break. Those are kind of the three options that I do after six weeks of a compound where there is some potential for desensitization. What to stack Magnolone with? Well, it doesn't have to be stacked with anything. I think a big misconception in the world of gear and anabolics is that you have to stack things together. Now, there's a benefit to stacking certain things when they're synergistic, you know, when one plus one equals three. That's why I designed the anabolic matrix, which has one column, uh, a growth pathway, I call it, which is the androgen receptor in the muscle tissue. And then you have other growth pathways, such as growth hormone and insulin, myostatin and inflammation and so on. So you'd get the most synergy by stacking something like a magnolone, which is an androgen receptor modulator on the androgen receptor anabolic column, with something from another column, like something growth hormone-based, insulin-based, something that reduces myostatin, or something that increases inflammation. Uh, so you can pick something from any one of those other categories. Now, if we're talking about just stacking with other anabolics, then you don't necessarily want to stack it with something that's similar, you want to stack it with something that's different. So within the androgen receptor uh, category, you have, in the steroid world, you have like testosterone-based compounds, DHT-based compounds, uh, progestins, progesterone-based compounds, and when you stack something from each of those categories, then you get synergy within that one column. So with the magnolone, the magnolone is actually highly anabolic and, and not very androgenic. So it would stack well with something that is androgenic, which kind of adds something that would otherwise someone could consider missing from magnolone or from SARMs. But once you do that, you're starting to get sort of away from the whole purpose of, of using SARMs in the first place. Uh, so if we're going to stack it with another SARM, uh, RAD140, would be an option for, let's say I'm feeling like my energy level's lower, or my strength is not increasing like I want, or my stamina in the gym, you know, because Magnolone is mostly like a mass builder. So if I want more of the performance and the contractile t connection, more mind-muscle connection, I could stack it something that's like a RAD 140, allowing me to train harder with it. Also, uh, S23 appears to be a bit more androgenic. So like I was saying, you can combine something that's highly anabolic with something that's more androgenic for some synergy. Uh, so that's why S23 could be beneficial to stack with it. Um, Osterine may have some ability to increase joint uh, tendon and ligament strength, which may help prevent injury and, and, and bone density. Also, it, it's possible that that has that advantage over other SARMs, and if so, then stacking that with it could have some potential benefit. Again, not necessary. Uh, I don't see much of a reason to stack it with something like an S4. Uh, it's it, you could do that in order to sort of dry out and give a more harder appearance, but I wouldn't be looking from f for that while on a cycle of Magnolone or LG43 anyways. I'm, I'd be using the Magnolone mostly as mass building, and so I, I wouldn't necessarily stack it with something that gives me the more harder, drier appearance unless I really cared what I was looking like while I was bulking, which most people prefer to prioritize the bulking and then sort of switch to the cutting afterwards, which I generally agree with that approach. I just do it in usually shorter segments, like even three days of bulking and three days of cutting instead of six weeks of bulking and six weeks of cutting. So the other option, instead of stacking at the same time with the Magnolone, would be to alternate compounds more frequently could use, or I, what I frequently do is I might use Magnolone for three days and then I might switch to uh, Sarmbalone or S23 or, or In order like any other things to know before even starting uh, your first injectable cycle, whether it's steroids or Sarms or whatsoever, are there any things to take care of before uh, doing this? I think the best thing someone can do before starting an injectable Sarm cycle is get their blood work done because you can never go back in time and know what your natural blood work was or what your blood work was before using some of these things. And it provides valuable data for you uh, so you know how your body's reacting to these things. Maybe this could be the, the hidden steroids of Machu Picchu for someone because they might have tremendous benefit and their blood work might show virtually no side effects and they know that they could keep using it. Or they might get their blood work done before and after and see that uh, it's really negatively impacted their blood work. And so then they know that maybe this compound or this type of cycle was, was not for them. Um, but it's, I, I hate to have people regret not ha getting their blood work before because we just can never go back in time to get our natural pre-anabolic, pre-steroid, pre-SARM, whatever, blood work. Now, what are the injectable SARMs that you have experimented yourself by now? And um, 
If you could choose between a life with limitless steroids or a life with limitless SARMs, um, which one would it be and why would it be? The injectable SARMs that I've experimented with so far off the top of my head have been uh, the Osterine was the first one ever and that was like three and a half years ago that, uh, that I first experimented with that. And then uh, more recently, within the last couple years, then was when we started experimenting with the uh, Sarmbolone, the injectable S23, uh, the Folitonic, the injectable YK11, uh, the Ragebolone, which is an injectable Rad 140, and the Magnolone, which is injectable uh, LGD 4033. So I think off the top of my head, those are the ones that I've personally injected so far. And uh, they all act very differently in the body. I mean, they all build muscle, but they all have sort of secondary effects. So it's been really interesting to experiment with each one. For example, the Folitonic seems to have the most potential to build the most amount of muscle in, uh, in the more advanced the lifter is. The Magnolone seems to be the best overall muscle builder bulker across the board. Uh, the Sarmbolone seems to be incredible for um, like drive, energy, uh, performance, uh, hardening of the muscle, muscle definition, and also size. Uh, the Rage Balloon seems to be really good for performance, uh, muscle definition, muscle hardness, um, uh, strength, stamina, and the Osterine. Uh, that's the one I actually need to inject with, uh, start experimenting with more because the formula that was used before was the old technology where we did our previous experiments, and now with the new transport technology, uh, and the way that they're formulated, they're so much more effective than the first generation. I haven't in it tried the Austrian second generation yet, but I will very soon. If you want to know whether I would choose a life of, of SARMs or steroids or neither, I think. And I initially started using and experimenting with SARMs and steroids when I was 30 years old. And at the time, I knew that I wanted to do uh, some steroids and I wanted to stay on TRT, but I knew that I also didn't want to be on steroids the rest of my life because of the accumulation of side effects. You see, steroids don't actually have that many side effects uh, contrary to popular belief. But the more you use them, and the more the side effects will accumulate over a lifetime. So it's like smoking, for example. You smoke for one week, it's not gonna have any effect on your health. You smoke every day for 20 years, it's gonna have some serious effect on your health. Now, if you smoke in short uh, bursts and you give your body breaks, kind of like cycling steroids or anabolics, it also creates a lot less strain. So what happens is the chronic nonstop use of something that creates the most amount of side effects. So I knew that going in because I knew a lot about biology and chemistry. It's always been my passion since I was 12 years old. I knew going in that I didn't want to be a chronic lifetime steroid user. So I was looking for alternatives to how I could more safely have all the benefits of steroids without the side effects. And that's when I started experimenting with SARMs. And, and going into the steroid world, I knew that eventually I wanted to transition to the SARMs because I understood the science of the SARMs. I just didn't realize how effective the SARMs would be. I didn't actually know at the time that SARMs could actually completely replace steroids. I thought I'd get maybe like 40% of the benefit for with with zero side effects with the like the low uh, the low dosages of the SARMs. At the time I didn't realize that if you increase the dosage they're actually more powerful than steroids and I didn't realize that if they're injected then they're significantly more powerful than steroids. This factual as far as actual androgen receptor activation, protein synthesis, lean mass uh, that that is permanently retained that is not based on just water or bloat. Um, so that being said, also I, I don't plan on blasting high dosages of SARMs also because, for, you know, never ending and chronic use because that also is going to come with some accumulated side effects. So what I do is I'll probably always run like a testosterone replacement therapy dosage of testosterone, a little bit of SARMs on top of it, and I can do both of those with no side effects. And then every once in a while, I'll blast a high dosage of injectable SARMs and put on a ton, a ton of muscle and transform my body and then just go back to a TRT and low dosage of SARMs for maintenance. And with that protocol, that approach, and everything that I know, I see absolutely no drawback whatsoever, only benefits, and it enhances every part of my life. It lets me eat whatever I want, travel the world, and maintain a physique. Uh, better than 99% of people who use steroids and have a regular exercise routine with their diet on point, 
preparing for competitions, like, like living the lifestyle. I'm all about, li- that's, that's great living the lifestyle, but you know, unfortunately as I travel around the world and live the lifestyle I do, I need to use them as a crutch and they work extremely well for that. I get to look like a professional bodybuilder every day of the year, 365 days a year for the rest of my life with no side effects in doing it and, and l- minimal impact on my lifestyle time consumption and, and money consumption in doing it. So I, I feel like I've kind of hacked the system. And so, yes, I choose that limitless lifestyle. I choose to be enhanced. Uh, and I will probably be the rest of my life enhanced in as many ways as possible. Okay. So I want to thank you, Tony, for being on the show again. And we will talk very soon. Thanks for explaining the ultimate guide for a Magdalene slash injectable SARM cycle. Um, is there anything you'd like to say to the viewers? Last thing the viewers I'd say is that uh, I appreciate what you're doing and I like to work with you to try to get the information out to more people. So feel free to keep uh, making requests of me uh, uh, to report on what my research has turned up. And uh, as you interact with your fans and followers and get uh, good questions and all that, uh, relay, relay those to me and I'll get you my best answer from me and Coach Trevor. Be swell and swell, my friend of Freedom Pioneer, Human been evolution. Okay, that was it for today's video with Dr. Tony Hughes. Thanks a lot for watching again. Don't forget to subscribe, turn on post notifications to be the first one to see my next videos. New content coming very, very soon. Go out to my Instagram, drop a follow there as well. I got Facebook and all these other social media platforms. Just go out to the description and links are there. So like I said, don't forget to subscribe. But thanks a lot for watching again, guys. It's the White Boy from the Yard.